Right. I thought we might start with like what you were doing up to say the age of like 16 sporting wise. What did, what did your life look like then? Uh, yeah, I was probably quite active as a kid always. Um, I actually remember before I used to go to school, I, uh, my parents advised that I would go for a run to get rid of energy before I went to school sometimes. So I think there was always um, an element of wanting to be outside and climb trees and go for runs outside and um, sort of have a mountain bike and come back muddy. And there was a lot of that. Um, and then I did a lot of sport. So I, you know, I always was doing stuff and um, often team sports. So, you know, football, rugby, I played a lot of cricket as well and tennis. So I, there was always sport involved, always, being physically active um and then otherwise just yeah just trying to tick the academic boxes but i sort of my fond memories are um yeah just trying to do stuff outside being being in nature and you know I, my dad grew up in scotland and i spent a lot of my life in scotland as well so i'd go up go up and down hills there in monrose at a young age and i think those are probably um things that stick with you a bit as well was your dad a bit of a sportsman himself uh, no, I don't think uh, he was. I think he he loves sailing, and I think he is a. Again, he he grew up in the middle of the Highlands in Scotland, and I mean, it, it's actually it sounds extraordinary now, but um, single mother in the fifties, um, and he didn't have electricity until he was fourteen years old. Um, lived in the Highlands, so I think he sort of was pretty used to being outdoors, and I think I probably had that sort of desire to be connected with nature and being outside from him but um I would take to mountains later on and he would stick to water which is not my comfort zone okay what sort of age were you being encouraged to go out for a run before school oh I think was we're talking young I mean I had a lot of energy as a kid um I always just uh, my, for my poor parents I would just sort of get up and wake them up and be like cool I'm up now I'm ready to go um and I think that probably dulled down. I appreciate a lion more now, but um, I think when I was young, it was just a lot of energy. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so then, uh, so, so you've written three books and we can talk about each of those, but your first uh, is about, you were the youngest guy uh, ever to, to scale the seven summits. So seven highest points uh, on each continent. Right. Um, what, what age was that, 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 that began? that journey so my dad gave me a book actually by bear grills uh called facing up and that was about bears ascent of everest uh, and i read this and yes yeah, something about that book struck a chord um whatever it was maybe bear's personal journey or more likely what he was trying to do which was climb everest so age 17 i suddenly thought that this was a great idea um and i think up until that age i'd probably been interested in sort of exploration and these sort of great Victorian explorers like Shackleton and Scott and things like that. I knew about Edmund Hillary and George Mallory, but never had climbed properly. But then I did some more research and found out about the Seven Summits, which is the highest mountain in every continent. And it seemed like an extraordinary thing to do, um, despite having no experience. And so I basically then set out this um, pretty ambitious, slightly foolhardy plan to try and work my way towards then climbing Everest, which as a naive, ignorant teenager um, was probably exactly that naive and ignorant. And then I sort of tried to put um, a plan in place to do that. And five years later, it worked out. But I think the the journey to get there was quite a um, was quite an upsy downy one. Where did where did that how did that journey start? Like you, you say, five years is that because there was like significant planning and training and preparation involved, or is it just like the, the logistics? Well, so each expedition takes a long time. Um, is is one part, but for me, the the major difficulty is fundraising. Um, I mean, the mountains cost a lot of money, and the highest mountain in every continent. You're going from, you know, Indonesia and Western Papua rainforest to um alaska for the highest in north america to the andes to antarctica to everest obviously and then um tanzania for kilimanjaro and then europe um russia so it's a very global adventure and um at the time i i didn't have any money so um it was sort of um a bold ambition 
initially and then you've got to try and work backwards and work out how you can do it and um yeah I left school and then just worked I, I was putting up marquees I was working as a barman um doing catering events how many days a week and I uh, worked in call centers and did sort of random odd jobs you know gardening or interior designing and stuff and um I then would work and go off on an expedition then came back and work and go off an expedition and, and did that before university so I did the highest in um, South America, Africa, and Europe before university. And I think they were uh, uh, amazing experiences. The, the the first one I did, you know, I, I was 18. Um, I'd done some sort of climbing in Scotland to learn what to do. And I was fit and um, and borrowed some clothing from different people and, and sort of learned the theoretical side of it. But I then rocked up um, to this mountain, which is a, uh, highest outside the Himalayas so it's a big old mountain it's 7,000 meters or just under and I was the youngest in our team by 10 years and suddenly you're going to uh, an environment that's pretty unique um, altitude is quite debilitating and you're there for three weeks and you're carrying all your stuff and you're living out of a tent and I remember I shared a tent with a I think of a 55 year old scouser and I think when you're 18 and you're suddenly surrounded by a whole group of people from all walks of life and all ages. Um, it's very grounding. And I think climbing is a very egalitarian activity. It's, it's, it's a very grounding thing to do. It's a very humbling thing to do. And um, I think it was part of a, a, a longer journey. It's quite a, like, obviously it's a long period of time to do it over and it takes a lot of motivation. And you, you said like you read Bear's book and that, sort of spark something in you but what what was the overriding motivator through all that time was there was it just like just the the, the feeling of achievement of of doing something like that was there something else like fueling you uh well I think at that age as a teenager there's lots of things that make you want to do these things and I think it's the same with um, some of the people you interview uh, for High Rocks as well, or, or anyone who wants to sort of achieve these things. Um, clearly, there was something in me that wanted to do something different to everyone else. Um, and Everest is a very obvious goal because it's the highest, because it's iconic. And I think what it represents. Um, but most of my friends were, were all doing something different. Um, they were sort of traveling and working. And, and then I was off trying to do this big global adventure which nobody else was doing um which can set you on quite an isolated path but it's quite hard to pinpoint and say i want to do it because of that reason i don't think it was ever that obvious i think it's probably a myriad of of growing up a search for identity a search for self-belief self-confidence a desire to achieve and whatever that may be and i think certainly as a young guy there's that Everest sort of has that appeal or the equivalent of Everest has that appeal of, of achievement. And I think that was probably what, what helps drive you. Okay. So I, I know there was more to this than, than just Everest. Um, but can we talk about your Everest experiences? Yeah. Um, so, so, so the first one, um, yeah. T talk to us about, you know, like getting to the point that you got to, and I, I know you eventually had to turn around and can, can you talk about that some more? Yeah, so I eventually, so I climbed the highest in North America in Alaska, fantastic expedition, and then booked Everest. And the difficulty was always was just getting to the mountain because I was young and didn't have any money. So immense fundraising and trying to get sponsorship and everything else. And then I found myself on Everest age 20. Um, and it was a yeah, heck of a learning curve. It's a obviously a, a very big mountain, a very unforgiving, hostile environment. And I climbed from the Chinese side, um, which is not the normal side, which is from Nepal. Um, so it's an incredible journey to get there. And then you have to spend two months on the mountain. Um, so it's not like if you were to climb a mountain at, at sort of sea level here, where you maybe walk up for three, four hours and then come back down again. Everest is eight and a half thousand meters or 8,800. And you have to get your body to adapt to it. So you almost go halfway uh, and then drop down again. Then you go two thirds of the way up and then down again. And then you go for your summit push. Um, and that's all trying to build, build red blood cells into your bloodstream. So you, you can then cope with the 
lack of oxygen because the summit has about 30 percent of the oxygen that we have here so physiologically it's a very fine line um and anyway i got i got to my summit push um and set off i was very tired admittedly and set off in the dark and then i just had a very very chaotic summit day um as did quite a few of our team members we had a very low success rate but essentially first problem my head torch cut off um so i was in the darkness for a bit and climbing without a rope and just trying to fumble around and then i had a series of incidents with my teammates um i had one who I was next to climbing with, who lost his eyesight. He thought it was um, cloudy and it wasn't. It was a clear blue sky, but his corneas had actually started to freeze at high altitude, which is not uncommon. A Sherpa who who we were with had summited twice before. Um, He thought he was going to die. Um, So he was taking photos of his family and throwing them off the mountain, accepting his own death. Um, It took another Sherpa to to punch him um, and get him down the mountain. Uh, a third teammate I came across uh, was incredibly altitude sick. He couldn't remember his own name. He couldn't remember how to put on a rucksack. Um, and again, was delirious and had, had to be injected with um, dexamethasone. And then a fourth teammate I came across had run out of oxygen, so he had to descend. So it was all a slightly chaotic day. I lost a lot of time and it's a very dangerous place. Um, and I was by myself. And I eventually got to a stage where I was probably three, four hours from the summit. So 150 meters from the top, which seems like not very much. Um, But I decided to turn around um, and then headed back down. And I was pretty beaten up about the decision. I mean, I was exhausted. I can't deny that. Um, And I was, I'd lost a lot of weight. I was dehydrated, et cetera. But it's very, very close, you know, a few hours from the top, but it's, you know, 50 meters ahead of me and 50 meters behind me on the route were bodies of climbers who had had the same decision and had died on the way down. So the the risk is, is a very real one um, and it can easily go wrong. So I, I was glad I did it. It just took a bit of reflecting back in the UK to understand that I had made those choices and it required a lot of, conversations with people with more wisdom and experience than me who could sort of tell me that it was the right choice and um, that it was better to come back alive with all my fingers and toes but lacking that summit photo than remaining a statistic on a mountainside yeah um what why 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 was it like it sounds like the conditions weren't bad that day but at the same time they were what why was it so tough at that at that point in time? Do you know? Yeah, so I mean, the um, exterior conditions were were very pleasant uh, within reason in terms of um, wind speed and and temperature. Um, it just it was one of those things where a lot of puzzle pieces incorrectly aligned in terms of the position of different people at different times, um, the equipment, the communications we had on the day. It was just a lot of things that didn't quite work. Um, and talking about learning from things that go wrong, the following year when we had the same situation, a few of us who were on the same team again had a very clear demand about what we wanted on summit day. So, you know, the following year, um, I returned uh, to Everest. I, I'd climbed in Antarctica and Indonesia in the meantime. So it was going to be the final mountain of my seven summits. And I changed a lot of things about what I wanted to approach the mountain with, whether that be protecting my throat, protecting my health, staying strong, getting more hours in and training, like a lot of different things. But there was also quite a few things on summit day itself that needed changing. And a lot of that was to do with communication, how and when and why and um, departure times and when you do those and how structured it is. And it made it a lot smoother. And I think I, I just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time a lot um, in 2010. And yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard. I, I, you know, turning, turning around that close is, um, is a very tough decision. And I, I, thankfully I, I did it because if I hadn't, it would have, I would have gone up and I was by myself at this point. I think that's important to clarify. There was no one else around really. 
Um, there was a few people up ahead, but I was the last one and I was 21 years old and alone at, you know, eight and a half thousand meters, which is not a place you want to be. And essentially I would have carried on for four hours by myself to summit. And I think I would have summited, but then you descend for 12 hours or eight hours by yourself. Um, and it gets dark, it gets windy, it gets cold, you run out of oxygen, you're tired. And that unfortunately is how you die. So uh, I was grateful and I still am now that I had the clarity to make those choices. It's a very mature decision to make, especially at that age, right? It's um, it, it would it'd be easy to be gun ho uh, at any age, but especially that age, I would imagine. Yeah, well, I mean, summit fever is a, a very real thing on Everest. Um, and I had a teammate of mine who had summit fever and carried on going um, when he shouldn't have and did survive. I don't quite know how, but he did. Um but then, you know, you have these very real situations about people that die because they make exactly those decisions. Someone the day after I made the choice to turn around, didn't make the choice to turn around, carried on going, summited and died on the way down. Someone the day before me, um, when I did summit, exactly the same situation, summited late, died on the way down. I literally had to clip over, um, unclip from a rope and reclip into a, another rope of a, a body of a, a climber who had died doing the same thing. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's quite a uh, full on experiences, especially at a young age, but the, the threat is a very real one. And yeah, I was, I was grateful. I made those choices. You mentioned that you went up the Chinese side, which is not the, the typical way to do it. Was there, yeah. was there a reason for that? Uh, I mean, primarily financially, to be honest, um, it costs less uh, to go up that side of the mountain. Uh, and then because there was a few mistakes the first year, I got a discounted rate the following year and I didn't have much money, to be honest. So um, if you could save me a couple of thousand pounds, I was quite keen to do it. Um, I also I like the history of it. Um, that's the same side that George Mallory tried to go up in the 1920s these sort of iconic pioneering expeditions where they sort of went up with um, tweed jackets and hobnail boots uh, and to debatably summited or not, but they, they climbed the same route a um, hundred years before. And I thought that history was amazing of these sort of pioneering Brits. So I quite enjoyed the history, um, but it was also, I liked the fact that it was slightly quieter. Um, you know, it was just on that side of the mountain because the Chinese didn't issue permits to tourists you only had climbers. So it was just the, the climbers that were there and there were no queues. And even when I did summit, it was just my Sherpa and I at the top. And I think those um, were all probably all factors. Okay. Um, but you ultimately, like like, like you said, you, you went back the next year, you summited. What was that feeling like? Was it, was it amazing to get it done? Yeah, I, d I did. I w went back and I was... I, I was very obsessed by where I turned around. I put my tent actually the following year right at the back of everyone's, which means I'd go to bed and wake up. I'd open the um, zip of my tent and you'd see Everest. And it's a astonishingly fortunate place to live for a couple of months when you look at the highest mountain in the world. I mean, it's, it's glorious. I've got pictures of it in every single condition you can imagine. Um, but really special place to be. And with some very wonderful people, um, Nepalese and international climbers and Brits. And I eventually then, um, I did summit and I summited with my Sherpa. And when, when I saw him the first day of our second trip, he was like, I'm going to summit with you later this year. And then he was with me pretty much every step of the way on summit day. And, um, yeah, it's, it's an astonishing place. It's a, you know, it's not an easy, um, thing to do to, to be in those conditions like humans aren't meant to be in those conditions um they're demanding and they stress you and you, you're above eight thousand meters is what's known as the death zone where your body's basically deteriorating so you're on exterior oxygen you're taking different drugs your appetite goes you can't take much water it's incredibly cold um but it's a it's a magical sight you know the sun rising when you're couple of hours from the top and then eventually you get to a state where you know you're going to finish 
and you know you're going to get to the end um and then i summited and it was a beautiful day and i was lucky my guide summited after me so i could call my um parents on a satellite phone so that was a pretty astonishing thing to do um and you got a sort of words of advice from them and then took a few photos and came down but i didn't actually i didn't take any photos for about 45 minutes i just sort of sat there just in complete awe of where i was for a while just pretty tired and then um yeah headed down quite lethargically is that an experience that you like that you chase now at all that you that you miss like is it like you know astronauts struggle to come back to earth like they, they miss that feeling is there is there anything like that that <laughs> wool wool ball number 99 um <laughs> The feeling of crossing a finishing line in high rocks is pretty close. Uh, I don't, I don't crave that, and I think that's probably a good thing. Um, I actually said to myself, I had a violently unpleasant night on my descent from Everest. Um, I was by myself in a tent, and it was just extraordinarily cold. And I actually said, I'm not going to go back to eight thousand meters again. And I've thankfully kept that promise. Fifteen years later, and. I think I probably, I don't need that sort of level of risk. And I was always asked, what do you want to do next? And um, and I found it a very unrelaxing question because I'd spent five years trying to do this and I wasn't that concerned about what to do next. And I, I certainly, I didn't want to put myself at that sort of risk again because it's a very dangerous activity. Um, and I didn't feel the need. I think it ticked a certain box off what I wanted. Amazing. Um, so your book about this is In Search of Sisu. Is that how to pronounce yeah. it? Yeah. Can you uh, can you tell us what Sisu is? And uh, yeah. Yeah, Sisu is a, a Finnish word, um, and it one of those wonderful Scandinavian words that doesn't translate into English, um, but it means courage, grit, inner resilience um in a belief and it kind of felt very apt I, I was out um camping and climbing in Finland and I came across this couple um who thought I was slightly mad but they said I had lots of sisu which meant absolutely nothing to me and then I researched it and I thought this word is perfect and then it sort of came to me while I was writing the book um that that's sort of what it was it it was a sort of journey of um not just writing the book but that whole five years of trying to climb those mountains was about trying to um i guess test your limits find your or expand your comfort zones um work out what you're physically and mentally able to do and i think that's sort of what what the concept of cc is and it, it's also i think it's about having the courage to commit to things um and just following through with them i think is all part of that same mentality uh, I saw on the uh, on the book you've got testimonials, if you like, from Bear Grylls and Sir Ranulph Fiennes, which is pretty nice. How how did they come about? Uh, well, I, I sort of looked up to them both in different ways. I mean, Ranulph Fiennes had done some amazing things in his life, and I sort of always looked up to him as this great British explorer. Um, and Bear Grylls, again, I, I read his book and I wrote to them both um and just said you know for xyz reasons i admire what you've done and um uh and how you've done it and um this was pre-everest and they helped me out with a bit of advice before everest certainly bear did and then we sort of kept in touch um during the process and then when i wrote the book um yeah they they were very kind in endorsing it okay so you got so you but a, but a small world. It's, it's like a sort of high rocks community. There's there's sort of British adventuring, exploring world isn't that big. Um, if you're sort of in that world and trying to do things that are um, sort of, I guess, at the forward edge, whether in, in terms of age or boldness or something, you probably come across each other. Mm -hmm. So after Everest, after like that that final summit, were you then like, what's next? What were you? What what was the next step from that? I know I know you eventually joined the military. Was that like the the, the next step for you? 
Yeah, it was. I finished. Well, I actually finished university, so I, I had to take time off um, from university to do these climbs. Um, you know, they they have their own challenges and commitments. These um, expeditions, and I think there's um, you know, following through with any plan that lasts half a decade or longer, or even slightly shorter. Same with a training plan for an event or something. It comes with its ups and downs, and I think um, it requires sacrifice as well. And I think I was quite happy after Everest to just take a pause and finish university and then get a degree. And then I yeah I joined the military, as you said. So I went through Sandhurst, which is um, officer uh, training, um, one year officer training for the British Army. So I did that. Um, I then commissioned as an officer and joined a sort of long range reconnaissance regiment and then served for another four years. So I did five years in total doing a range of different things um, around the world and instructing some soldiers at the end um, for 18 months. So really varied uh, chapter, wonderful people, um, proud to do it in many ways. Um, well, in a lot of ways, I was, I was very proud to to serve in uniform. I, I found aspects of it a challenge. Um, I wasn't always drawn to rules and being told what to do and... Um, that I found that difficulty and I probably pissed a few bosses off by not adhering to everything I should have, but it was an incredible experience and, and I'm very grateful I did it. So that, that, that year at Sandhurst, which you have written a book about as well called hurry up and wait. Did, did was that particularly tough that year? Yeah. Sandhurst is a unique place. Um, it's, you know, very traditional, uh, and you're you go from civilian to officer in a year and you come out incredibly well trained very efficient very effective as a a leader a thinker very very physically capable um and your productivity is a lot you can do a lot at the end of that year but you're you're taking someone from zero to hero so it's quite full on. And the, the first day is called Ironing Board Sunday, actually, where you rock up on a Sunday outside of Sandhurst with an ironing board um, and a suit. And then you're sort of put into overalls with a name tag. And suddenly it just says Stuart here and you're in overalls and you're kind of depersonalized quite fast. Um, and then they sort of slowly take you through this process and you then have a big parade 44 weeks later and you're an officer, but it's a, it's a fascinating process. And I always found with the army, and this is my, maybe why it wasn't quite right for me was I wasn't always very good at the, the very conformist side of it. And I would sort of think that various things we were doing were slightly odd. Um, and I couldn't quite make sense of rules that were sort of there just for the reason or, um things we'd always done it this way and I think when I eventually wrote the book it was my way of sort of channeling some of the inaccuracies that people perceive with the military also having a bit of fun with it but trying to get across it's also a very serious place and you need an army and a country needs an army and you need soldiers and you need officers and Sandhurst is very very good at doing that um and I think it was it was quite easy for us who had gone through it to downplay it because that's just sort of what you do in the military. It's all about sort of grounding yourself and and being humble. And it was about trying to get that across of what you've actually achieved and the importance of it, but also the slight absurdity of it because it is also a slightly absurd place. Um, and I think when you take a snapshot of it, years later you go that is that's a it's a heck of a way of spending a year um <laughs> so i just kind of wanted to poke a bit of fun at it but also get across the seriousness do you look back like you said like some of the silly rules the pointless stuff do, do you look back now and like realize that there was a point to some of that or you're, you're still just like that was silly. no actually but i had a boss who asked us a few weeks before we left do you think there's anything you've done in the last year that's pointless and obviously everyone's hands shot up like, oh, yeah, we did this. We had to collect leaves in autumn, which then blew back. We had to do these morning parades or like search for bombs in the morning. Or, you know, certainly when you start in the first couple of months, you have to get up 
with a litre of water flip flops and you sing the national anthem together at like five in the morning. It's a like it's an extraordinary place. Uh, but actually, there's sort of a point to all of them. And this is why I thought it was interesting taking a sort of bird's eye perspective on the course and with the benefit of hindsight, understanding why they did certain things at certain times in that year to try and instill a certain value in you or make you think in a different way or um, and give you a problem that you then might encounter later in life or certainly later in your officer training. And I think what Sandhurst does is it, it just gives you the um, the building blocks to, to, to go from. So you kind of know that those are the rules. And then if you want to veer away from them, if you want to like make a mistake, it's under your volition, but you've kind of got a grounding. You've got the building blocks. Um, and I think it does that very well. Not without you, uh... I found it an infuriating place because it's so um, rule based and I it's not how I thought. So it was a very frustrating. But I think that's part of it is trying to just give you those tram lines to work in. You mentioned um, like the physical side; it sets you up very well physically as well. Do you, is there? I mean, as this is a, a Horrocks podcast, is there anything that you feel like? I don't know, maybe like stay with you during that time about like pushing yourself physically. Is it the amount of training that you did? Anything like that that that, that sort of stands out to you when you look back? Yeah, I, I've I've always loved the physical side of it, um, and Sandhurst is physically tough. Um, and you do a lot. I think people at Sandhurst would probably make really good high rocks athletes because you're able to do a lot. You're a very rounded athlete. So you can do anything from a 12 mile March with a heavy pack on your back to super quick running efforts, to jumping around, to carrying stuff to, you know, it might be like, carrying a mate on your shoulder or it could be like carrying a rifle a five kilo rifle in your arm for how many miles like you're very capable and i think um you know like the obstacle course i did a spartan race a couple of weeks ago for the first time and if you're in the army that's almost just like a given because there's obstacle courses at every training camp in the country um and i loved it and so i was always you know one of the fitter people at sandhurst and always loved that side of it um and I think a lot of the people I went through training with would probably be very good at high rocks. And I know that there's quite a few military guys who do it, and I'm not surprised. And I think, you know, if you get a couple of the absolute weapons in the army to commit to to high rocks, they would do very well. Yeah. I think there's, I like, there's, I... there's a robustness that the army tries to get across and a robustness and resilience and just a stick it out mentality, which... Um, that comes from training, but it also comes from just the desire to, to want to do that in the first place. Is a, I mean, I've certainly had a few military guys on 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 this podcast, and then I know we were talking before London when you were doing the mixed doubles, and like you knew like some of the top guys in that were ex military as well, weren't there? So, yeah, this this there's certainly a lot in the sport already, and I, I can see that increasing um, for sure. Um, so after after the military. You came out. Uh, what did you do? Yeah, I mean, so the day I handed in my um, military identification card, I headed out off on my bike. Um, I packed my life into five bags and um, went on a very long bike trip for a year and a half. And I think that probably in itself says something that as soon as I could, I sought about as far from the other end of the spectrum in terms of freedom that you could. So, yeah, I then went around the world for, what, 34,000 kilometres um, or so um, across Europe, Asia, Australia, America, and then eventually came back home with some shocking, <laughs> shocking tan lines. <laughs> so, But the thought was literally... What was the thought? It was, I, I just need some freedom to go and do what I want. It, was it, I just want uh, the achievement of riding across the world? What what sort of sparked it? Uh, I think I, I looked up to these sort of great solo adventurers a long time. So these people have done these big walks or bike rides, and I kind of thought that there was something very liberating about it. Like the appeal of the open road, I think, had a certain romantic appeal. Um 
And also it was just so far removed from what I was doing. Like you go from wearing a beret and uniform and saluting to then wearing a cap, shorts, sandals, and just going whatever you want, whenever you want is a, is a very emancipating thing to do. There's no one telling you what to do. And I think that's, you know, a psychologist, I'm sure would have a field day, but even the fact that I, I didn't start out at Australia and cycle back home. I just said, I want to go to New Zealand. I want to go as far away as I can. And I think there's almost certainly a level of escapism there of not wanting to do, to settle down and do a normal job. I just wanted to get off on my bike and go. And I love cycling. I, I just think it's even, I'm sure we'll talk about high rocks training, but I went for a long bike ride the other day because it just breaks up training monotony and there's something about being out on the road on a bike that i just find um it's like trail running it just gives me peace of mind um to be outside and uh, okay multiply that by you know 430 days like i was away and you, some of it loses its appeal but um there's still a joy in, in what you what you see and what you're able to do and i encountered uh, a, a whole range of different scenery landscapes people cultures um that i think i feel very very fortunate to have done and it's also, it's an incredibly cheap way of traveling i i basically i saved money for the last six months of the army and just lived off like 10 pounds a day for a year and a half um i paid all my bills before i left and canceled my phone and canceled everything i could and just set off and you just live off. I lived out of a tent for 200 nights. Um, and, you know, so of those 430, I was in a tent for 200. I stayed with locals for about 100, stayed with other people for about 100 and maybe paid for accommodation about 30 um, in like a small hostel or something. Otherwise, you're just camping on the side of the road somewhere. So it's a it's a very unique lifestyle. But um I think it's not something I'd want to do for the rest of my life. But again, for for a period of time, it's a, a wonderful thing. Was, it, was there a point where you were just like, oh, this was a bad idea? Yeah, yeah, there was. I, <laughs> I, um, I, I Again, I, I don't know, I was a complete glutton for punishment, but I, there was a, a fork in the road in Kazakhstan. And if you take the genuinely a road with a T-junction, if you take a right, you take the same route that most cycle tours take. And if you take a left you basically skirt around the whole of Kazakhstan and you skirt by the Russian border. Um, and I did that and you don't, I didn't see another cyclist from there for about another 8,000 miles until I got to um, Southeast Asia. So an astonishingly long time. I went through, you know, six months or so without seeing another cyclist because of the route I was taking. And I did it midwinter. So cycling through like Siberia and in, in midwinter, it goes down to minus 40 um i mean it's it's brutal My, minus minus 40 plus you know five ten degrees or something it's it's a uh, excruciatingly cold and you know i had like studs on my tires i had goggles face mask down jackets i had camel um camel socks i put on my handlebars because the metal got too cold it was incredibly unpleasant I, I i was i was unable to sleep because it was so cold so i would end up doing just like sit-ups and things in my um in my tent because i would just get too cold i had to get my heart rate up um every morning was was incredibly difficult just trying to motivate yourself to get up in the morning that didn't last that long but it was for a period of maybe a month six weeks of wow. um really really struggling um yeah so, so similar question to what I asked earlier about when you were doing the seven summits, was there this like overriding motivation through this, like really tough, really lonely, presumably at times, was there something spurring you on or was it just the, the escape from the, from the military, like the, the freedom, yeah. everything like that? I think the, um, it probably has to go beyond just the escapism because you get to that stage. It'd be very easy to just say, I don't need this in my life. So, I think what does happen though is it when it got incredibly hard was um, your life becomes rather narrow in terms of what you can care about, especially when it's like genuinely dangerous. I .e. like it was so cold that if I hadn't got up in the morning, I would have just been found frozen on the side of the road. So you actually have to get up. 
but it, it it's the same way that in a high rocks race you often get to the point where you just like, i've just got to get through the next run just get to the lunges and then just get through the lunges and start the next run and you can't think like, oh god i've got you know 100 wobbles to at the end of this it's just like no i just got to get to the next station and it was almost the same with that cycle it's just like, i've just got to do the next hour of riding do the next hour of riding and then pause you know have a sip of tea get to the next cut to then fill up my water bottles then get to the end of the day park your bike put your tent up and then start the next day get through the night then start the next day and it was just breaking it down massively and you're always looking for the next bit it was sort of get to the border of china then it was get to vietnam then it was get to singapore and you kind of create these arbitrary checkpoints all the time and then it was get to sydney then it was to get to auckland go across America and you create these um, self-imposed, I created my own self-imposed deadlines and, and objectives to get to that you kind of, you didn't think, oh, I want to do 23,000 miles or 22,000 miles to get back to home. You just go, I just want to do this bit. Um, and then I realized when I was in the South of Australia, that I wanted to go home. Um, and that was a, a good thing um, that I realized sort of why I'd gone on the trip and I'd had a wonderful time. I'd spent at that point, several thousand miles going across the center of Australia in this stunning, barren, remote um, desert. And I was like, I think, um, you know, I kind of miss my family and my friends and I'm 10,000 miles away from home. And I think that's a good realization that actually I loved being away and I felt free and liberated, but I cared more about, not having those things and and wanting to be near them yeah you uh you did this on your own basically yeah you you mentioned that you that the the, the the summits were largely on your own is there uh is there a reason for this like that, that you want to do things on your own is it like feeling um, of achievement or just i think there's um there's a challenge in doing it on your own. I think certainly with this cycle, I really wanted that, um, despite having done the seven summits in the military, I wanted the idea of being self-sustainable, of having this, like you're responsible for yourself. You don't need someone else telling you what to do or how to do it. And you don't, there's no one else sort of looking after you. It's like, this is your own survival mode. And I, I felt that was important. I think for the cycle, because so much of it, the way you do a trip like that is very personal. How you want to camp, how many, how far you can go, how fast you can go, all of those things that are just, you know, when you want to stop and go to the loo and what road you want to take. And I took some huge route decisions that happened to cross my mind a few hours before I did it. And it completely shifted the whole point of the trip. And if you're with someone else, you can't do that necessarily. And there's also, there's not that many people who, I don't think there's anyone that would have wanted to join me on those climbs when I was 18 years old. And I don't think anyone, you know, would have wanted to join me on that cycle at that time. It requires a lot of sacrifice. I was fortunate that I could save money at the time I was single. Um, I was saved money for the job. I, I didn't have any children. I, you know, so all of the things came together that allow you to take a year and a half off. Now the idea of, cycling around the world for a year and a half i don't i have no desire to do that like I, I enjoy my life here i've got a wonderful girlfriend and i don't want to leave the world for a year and a half and equally i don't want to spend five years trying to climb these mountains and i don't you know i think you, you then go through these different waves of motivation to do different things and i've I've fortunately done a lot of things with other people as well. So I've done some amazing bike rides, um, different places and runs and obviously military endeavors with other people. And I think I quite like the balance of sometimes it's, you want that teamwork, that team ethic. It's like with high rocks, you do some races by yourself and some with other people. And I think you get a different dynamic for each one. You do them for different reasons. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so, yeah, you said, you said you don't necessarily want to go and do, bike ride across the world now but but you are doing high rocks yeah um uh how, how did you find out about that and yeah tell us about you know what your experiences in high rock so far yeah so i've always done um endurance events um 
I did my first marathon when I was 21. I then did an Ironman and I've done a range of stupid and silly things in, in different places over the years. Um, anything from sort of ultra marathons and hundred mile races to 24 hour bike rides and anything in between and cross country skiing. I kind of love them all for different reasons. And I just finished, um, which marathon, Amsterdam marathon. And a friend told me about this thing called high rocks. Um, And I thought it looked quite cool. I just thought it was suitably interesting that there was a bit of strength involved and a bit of running. And I thought this is great. Um, I then did London in what, 2022 was my first race. So I did open um, in Excel and thought it was cool. I, I, I did a couple of simulations before the first race because um, I only had a month to train for it from when I heard about it to then doing it. So I did a couple of simulations, worked out what sort of speed I needed to get to to get like a world champ place. And I was like, you probably need about a 105, 106. And I got that. And then it kind of, you know, your eyes open. You go, this is <laughs> <it's> dangerous. <laughs> um, because, you know, I knew that there was... I had sort of some of the attributes to to do okay in it and, and I enjoyed it and it was sort of a, it was a good vibe. I liked what they had done. CrossFit I found was a bit too technical and a bit too weight heavy for me. Um, but this was a nice balance of strength and endurance and speed um, that I thought was good. What, uh, what times have you achieved since in the, in the, I know you've done like pro, you've done the doubles recently in London. What times have you got there? Uh, probably 105 open was my very first race and then um pros about 105 i seems i've got three times in 105 <laughs> see what i can do with and then i did doubles men's doubles in 57 mixed doubles in 55 in london a couple of weeks ago so yeah a real real range i i i just you know i guess like like everyone who does high rocks i probably haven't found the right race um you haven't nailed a perfect race yet but um I, I sort of, hey, we'll we'll see how it goes in Nice. I'd like to think my training's got better. I, I find the whole training process, the physiology, the psychology, the programming side of it fascinating about how you try and get your body to to work and understanding it and and peaking for different races. I think it's it's fascinating in the way the sport's developed is fascinating. Um, and I think it's it's been really impressive, and I've I enjoy following it, and I enjoy seeing new people come along and the approach that they take to it and their backgrounds. And I think it's just it's grown incredibly well, and um, I think it's been nice to be part of that journey. So you, you said it haven't nailed the perfect race, but I should say you like you won the overall mixed doubles in London, which is a big achievement, to be fair. 55 minutes. Yeah, that, that was thanks. Yeah, I mean, that was a that race probably did go according to plan. I don't think many have, in fact, none have. There's always something when you go, you know, I blocked out in the wall balls or I just couldn't do another burpee or whatever. I didn't quite, you know, the sleds didn't move properly. That one, it was an interesting race because I, you know, I've known Kate for a long time and I sort of knew the start list. And I spoke to you about the start list before. And I knew there were some people that were quite quick. And I sort of was like, my reckon we could get under an hour, but I don't know how much. And then it just kind of, it, I what I enjoy about the doubles is that you can get a bit nerdy with, if you understand your teammate well enough, um, is how to break it down to, to be as effective as you can. I think there's probably a, a threshold up until the run speed. And I think the the stations, the your margins, such small margins now with the doubles, um, but the runs, it's about how fast you can push those. And then what I enjoyed working out was right. If you, you know, what speed can we both run at depending on which station you do beforehand. And I think that's quite a, a fine line of how much you're willing to go into the red to then be able to run at a certain speed. Um, but yeah, it was, I mean, it was a great race. There were like three, five of us probably in the mixer and then three in the final few stations. Then two of us went into the wall balls together. Um, and I, I thought that was cool because even even with wall balls, like, you can do wall balls quicker than there's different speeds of doing it. There's It's not like there's a metronome, that's how you do a wall ball pace. And I think that's disregarding no reps. Um, 
there's a sort of there's ways of doing them quicker and you can even watch the pros do it uh, what was it, the race that just happened with lucas and john were doing wall balls and you could just see that the turnover rate is slightly different um and i think if you're training with pro weight so then do open weight you can really get your speed up if you change your technique slightly mm -hmm. um so i found the whole thing was um was great and if you can communicate with your partner um it works very well and you sometimes just have to be on a run a bit like how are you feeling like can you push the pace a bit more or you get to the start of a station be like right i just need you to do the first 30 seconds and then i'll do the rest and that's or i just do i just need 20 wall balls from you is what i said to kate i was like just do 20 wall balls i can do the rest if if i need to i'm broken or you can do the last 20 or like whatever and i think having that sort of communication um it's probably what helped us quite a lot and you run together and you know i had to sort of chalk that you give to each other and these just little things that probably make a difference yeah, yeah um you said when you were talking about like the training that you love it and you love like almost like geeking out on it has there been anything that you've changed your mind on training for high rocks over the last like couple of years is it been anything like oh, that don't work or i need more like threshold running or, or or anything like that well i mean i i've got to thank you and paul initially because i didn't know what i was doing and then um i spoke to you whatever it was february last year and i mean i'd never taken creatine before or beta alanine i'd never even heard of so <laughs> you know but even that side of it has been fascinating about understanding different supplements and not thinking that creatine was like some eighties muscle boosting thing, like, which is probably what I thought. Like there's a lot of education as part of this journey. And I find that interesting. And then, yeah, the, the training, it's just, I guess constantly you're just on a fine line of pushing it to not get injured and not get too tired. And, and I think that's, I find understanding that razor line is quite interesting of how much you can push it and then understanding when you just need to, you know, like on, on Monday I went for a long bike ride. It was a nice day and it wasn't necessarily part of my training schedule, but I, I was like, I don't think four or five hours sat on a bike is going to harm me, but I think it's quite good for my mental health to, to do that and you can break up your training slightly because otherwise you just keep smashing ergs and keep smashing lunges or something. But I think it's important to try and to try and change things up. But what I like is, is you learn from these different athletes and that might be Hunter doing one thing. It might be watching what, you know, Alex Ronkovich does or Megan does like the really, really good athletes or, or seeing some of John's training sessions. Like I like understanding um what they're doing and why and i've probably got to a stage now what i i've always you know i've run a lot over the years so I, you know i'd always do an interval session a threshold session a long run most weeks those are like my absolute bread and butter like sessions then you just switch them up about what time of year you're doing i probably do one compromise run a couple of weight sessions um maybe one or two oak sessions in a week and it you kind of then end up at about the right volume and then I, there's some things I definitely don't do as well as I should, but on the whole, it's sort of things trend in the right direction. And, you know, I get very focused on the whole um, process, not outcome thing. And I think you have to, you have to just, it's why I like training plans. You just put your training plan in place, execute it. If it works, then great. If it doesn't, you go, okay, fine, scrap it. Let's start another one. Let's see what else works. And it might work and it might not, but, I think there's a sort of science in that that's quite fun. Um, you just have to have the belief that these are long-term projects and you're probably not, you're not going to beat someone like Hunter who's been OCR racing for 10 years. You, mm -hmm. you know, I started doing high rocks a year and a half ago. I remember Alex Ronkovich put this post up recently and he was like, I haven't missed a training session in five years. Like he'd been doing elite 15 racing for five years that like you're not going to get close to these people in a year and a half. You have to sort of trust that you just keep on trying to improve and, and be the best version of yourself. And I think that's really the most important thing is, is working out what, what your level is and then just trying to get the best out of yourself. And that might take you to a professional level. It might not, but I think you always want to improve. It's why I like, oddly, a lot why I like marathons Marathon, the distance is a distance. It's, you know, it's like a half marathon, a marathon. 
and I'm never going to beat Elliot Kipchoge in a marathon race, but I'm pro- I'll probably finish 50 minutes behind him. But I love the fact that each time I do a marathon, you go, cool, it's not about finishing 1,000s. It's just about trying to be the best version of yourself. And I think that's a, a good a good ambition. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Mindset-wise in a race, like, I think you sort of touched on it, like the, I call it chunking, you know, focusing on just getting, you know, whatever the burp is done. Is that, is that what you are thinking about in those times or is there anything else? Yeah, I think that's certainly a factor. I, I, I monitor my heart rate. You did an interview with Ryan and Shadeg and he did the same thing and he runs with a heart rate monitor. I, I'm quite obsessive about my heart rate. I've also tracked it since I was a teenager as well. Um, and it's a fine line of, I remember you did one with Tim Venish, who was like, I run without a watch or just goes on feel. And it's this fine line sometimes of, do you want to go on feel? Do you want to understand your threshold? Because you don't have the impact of caffeine and adrenaline and everything. Um, but I think what's good about high rocks as well, and what's interesting about doubles is that very fine line of how much you can push. And even in the, I did a Malaga race and I know that, okay, you finished the wall balls and you're exhausted. Of course you are. You do a hundred wall balls. Like you could do that now and I'd be exhausted. So your heart rate spikes at the end, but the whole time I was like, I'm definitely within myself. Like on the run, certainly I was like, I'm managing my own pace. Then you finish being like, I should have pushed it a bit harder. Um, and that's, then you can go in the red if you push it too much. So I think that's quite a fine line. I guess what I like is that it, you, it's, it requires a bit of thinking, the race. It's not just flat out. You have to think about when you're going to maximize your lactate levels, when you're going to when you're gonna go into the red and accept it, when you really need to focus on your running form, how you try and recover your muscles, how you prepare for the next exercise. And I think there's – I quite like the fact that you need to think through the race while doing it. You know, you get onto a row and you go, right, what speed can I realistically sustain here? Like how, you know, what, what is the right pace? Um, even on the farmer's carry, the first couple of times I did it, I would have, even in Manchester last year, I had like the third quickest farmer's carry time because I just burnt through it. And fantastic. My ego was very happy at the end. <laughs> I got the third or fourth fastest farmer's carry. Well done me. But also my heart rate spiked at the end of it and I was exhausted. So in the end, the 10 seconds I gained from doing a farmer's carry quickly definitely shot me on the next run. So you're better off pl- planting your ego to one side and getting yourself ready to do the lunges correctly because you'll probably make up that 10 seconds on the next run. And I think that's interesting. I'm trying to, you know, like trying to improve my running is a constant thing. And it's, it's not so much about the engine now, it's just about efficiency of movement. And that's probably a project for the next year which is, I find quite interesting. So, yeah, I think in terms of the race mentality, it's it's probably chunking is is the best thing and, and trying to not think too far ahead is the desirable, not always possible. Yeah. You, you're talking about like when to push, when not to. Like, I don't love racing too often because it like takes so much out of me. But at the same time, that race experience... It, like there's always something to learn in every race isn't there and i think you get a better feel for when you can push and when you can't and when you need to hold back i think that that only really comes in a race it's hard to like truly get in training um so even like that just balancing how often to race and a lot but knowing that you're going to get the experience from it i think is something that i, I think about a lot as well yeah well how often to race and which races you really prioritize um and not trying to do it too often. I spoke to to Jade after, yeah, I spoke to her at the Spartan race and about her wanting to race straight after a race didn't go according to plan. And sometimes a race doesn't go right and you go, God, I want to go straight back at it, but you've got to not do that. And sometimes you want to go, I feel good now, I want to race, but you're better off just holding back. Yeah, a really good running coach uh, I know is, says he spends most of his time holding his athletes back rather than pushing them. Like, it's not hard to make an athlete go, right, go flat out. But actually, the strain, even in training, the strain that puts on your body is a very fine line of you're then compromising the session. You're going to be burnt out by Thursday and you're not going to hit your Friday session. Well, two sessions on Friday because you've gone too hard for three days. Um 
And I think that's, it's yeah, the whole thing's a razor line. It's same with injuries. Like I got injured doing deadlifts the other day, which was stupid. I was berating myself because I didn't need to do it. And my girlfriend said the fair comment, which was the mentality of getting injured by trying to lift too heavy a deadlift is the same mentality that means you want to push it in a race or push it on your runs or push it in other aspects of life. Like it's the same mentality because if you're not going to push it, then you're not going to find that limit. And I think that's, that's part of it yeah 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 for sure all right well this has been brilliant thank you so much um you've written three books is there is there another one in the works another one planned yeah there is i just can't get in the right headspace I, i'm trying to write a fiction book I'm, I'm sort of halfway through it i've done the draft years ago picked it up again last year i just high rocks has freaking taken over my life <laughs> you do like a couple of sessions a day and then you spend the rest of the time on a foam roller or an ice bath or with a muscle gun you welcome need, to my world yeah quite and then oddly with writing to however pretentious it sounds you need to get your head space right to be able to think so yeah i'll keep writing because i like i like reflecting i actually want to write one on physiology as well um and like how different athletes in different sports you can specialize in different sports and be a perfect athlete like you might have someone like hunter or lauren who's a perfect high rocks athlete but then you could have a sumo wrestler and you're not saying one's better than the other they're just they're specialists and then compare that with a gymnast who's five foot one i love the fact that you can get these exceptional athletes um with totally different body types i quite want to profile them all mm -hmm. interesting yeah. okay all right so if people want to follow you find out more about you where should they go uh yeah but i mean look probably on my instagram it's pretty erratic my instagram um in terms of content but that's probably where i do stuff and then if you want the, the books on amazon about the cycle or the climbs or sandhurst and you've got a website as well right and i've got a website yeah yeah okay um all right anything else we should have talked about Hey, there's, I could go down a wormhole with you talking about high rocks. I mean, it's. I think. I think we can both properly nerd out on that. <laughs> um, no, I love your podcast, mate. I, I think you get some. Some. We all learn from it, and I think it's amazing. Probably some of the very best people in high rocks probably learn from from you and what you do. So I think it's awesome. I also, to, to be fair, when I first I told you I had like a month to learn about high rocks at the very start. I think your website was like the point of reference that I did for all of it. Um, and I think that probably, I doubt I'm the only one. Thank you. Appreciate you, mate. That's all right. All right. Well, this has been fantastic. I will, uh, I will see you in Nice. Hey, sounds good to me. It should be nice there. Should be. Thank you. Hey, that's all right.